Welcome to the Halloween season! I realize what I look like right now, okay? In my mind, this is a, a genius, very meta Halloween costume I've gone for. In like 2009, or sometime around the time Mabav aired, I dressed up as a vampire for Halloween, as I did for probably around five years in a row in my adolescence, and I tried to recreate the look the best I can today. Let me take the glasses off so you can like truly appreciate the uh you know the full the full extent that I tried to go to for this. Sadly I don't have the fedora anymore so you're just gonna have to uh suffer without that. I am very hyped for this Halloween season if you can't tell already and because of my excitement I have decided to attempt to upload one video a week throughout the entire month of October. This is gonna be very hard for me considering I can barely get a video out a month these days. But that's because I'm a full-time student and I just dropped a merch store. There's gonna be special merch for this occasion, by the way. And you know, of course, that takes time to work on as well. Go to comicbookddr.shopify.com if you wanna check out some really cool handmade buttons and bracelets. Everything is under $5 right now, and I'm currently holding a Halloween sale where everything that is Mabav related at my merch store is 25% off. There's also exclusive merch that will only be available for this month, so go check it out. I'm genuinely so excited uh, to get into this, and you're probably also wondering, I wonder what the topics of these Halloween-themed videos are going to be. Well, My Babysitter's a Vampire themed, of course. I am a My Babysitter's a Vampire channel at the end of the day. Yeah, I may talk about music and other Disney Channel shows and movies or whatever, but at my core, I'm a bad YouTuber, okay? I want people to know that right now. Every video I make is me just biding my time until I can talk about my bath again. So I thought I would just go head first into it for the month of October. Again, no promises uh, that I can actually do this. I'm really just, you know, hoping. <laughs> I'm gonna try my best, guys. October is seeming like it's gonna be a very busy month for me, because uh, like I said, I'm a college student. Midterms are like the first week of October, and then I'm actually moving not out of here, this is my dorm where I live on campus, um, my dad is moving and a lot of my stuff <laughs> is at my dad's house still. So I'm, you know, moving that to a new house as well. So yeah, I'm gonna be very, very busy during this month, um, accidentally. I had this planned like months and months ago and this all just kind of ended up happening around this time. No one make fun of me if I don't actually, um, <laughs> if I don't actually get it done. So, on to the topic of today's video. We are going to be doing some color analysis for the characters in My Babysitter's a Vampire. The two specific channels I want to shout out are Art by Midnight and Modern Girls. I love all of their videos and whenever they upload I'm immediately sat and ready to watch. So, huge shout out to them for being my inspiration. The problem with Mabav being so short and being cut off so soon um, on a cliffhanger, if you weren't aware already, is that it's actually quite hard to tell how much of the show was a deliberate like element of storytelling and how much of it was just kind of an accidental element of post-production. The show had a very, very low budget and not a lot of eyeballs on it while it was being created. So I want to preface that, I want to set that up, you know, like I understand the show I'm talking about and how the costume designers maybe just had to work with what they had. What does it mean to apply color and style theory to a show like Macbeth? That's what we're here to find out. So I've seen plenty of people do style and color analysis videos for much more prestigious series and movies like Euphoria or Game of Thrones. But since I'm the My Babysitter's a Vampire YouTuber, it seemed only fair that I do the same for this series. For those who don't know, I have made many videos on Mabav in the past and hosted a podcast with two of my friends where we reviewed every episode of the show, including the movie. So if you want to check that out for more context on the show, then feel free to. You don't have to have seen the show to get this video, but there will be spoilers ahead. Just be aware of that. So I'm very aware that the fashion in this show isn't all that revolutionary or anything. All of the clothes are very trendy looking for the time, which makes them look very dated today. And they're not fashion forward at all. But in my opinion, this element of the show does make it feel more relatable and realistic for a bunch of Canadian teenagers who are pretty average and have bigger things to worry about than the clothes they might be wearing and what the kids at school might think of them. The boys especially dress more utilitarian than anything else, except for Rory, but we'll get to that later. And everything looks like they got it for a decent price at the mall or maybe even a place like Kmart. 
I'm kind of sad that Kmart doesn't exist in the United States anymore because that is 100% where I got all of my clothes growing up when I was watching this show. Luckily, we do have some behind the scenes information on how the costumes are picked, so we don't have much, but we have a few DVD exclusive and behind the scenes interviews. A great resource for this video was a mutual that I have on Tumblr called Fantastic Girl, who has a posted series of Babav style finds on their account, detailing specific clothing items and where they came from. Also, another mutual of mine, Your Bro, has uploaded all of the DVD special features to YouTube for easy viewing, so I recommend checking their channel out, since there's plenty more Amazing My Bad videos on there, including the unearthing of the uncensored movie. Yes, you're right. You've watched this censored version of the movie your whole life. So anyways, let's get into the character, color, and style analysis. Sarah is the character I wanted to start with because I think she has the most interesting and evolved style throughout the series as a whole. As someone who's going through a lot in the background of the show, her clothing and color choices can be seen as more of a reflection of her inner psyche than compared to the others. She generally wears quite feminine clothing, opting for things like heels, cropped jackets, and sometimes shorter skirts. Her standard school clothes show her in denim jeans and layered shirts with tank tops or vests, which in contrast to her best friend Erica, who is often not seen in layers and showing more skin in her outfits, can be seen as Sarah being more reserved and a guarded person in general in contrast to her friend. In season one especially, Sarah is in somewhat of an awkward place since she's neither fully a vampire yet nor a mortal anymore. A runner for her during this season is her conflict with finding where she fits in, all while having to beat up a new monster of the week and be a babysitter for the Morgan household. In my opinion, I see this conflict represented well in the colors she wears during the beginning of this arc in the season. The main colors we see Sarah in are pink, purple, and blue. She is sometimes also seen wearing black, muted green, and beiges as well, but especially early on in the show, the first three colors I mentioned seem to be what they are consistently putting her in. Pink is her most true color, and lighter saturations and pastel versions are seem to be what she wears the most often. Pink can represent femininity in the modern day, as well as innocence and tenderness. We don't get to meet Sarah before she's been turned into a fledgling, but we pick up from dialogue and her general disposition that her only goals were to be an average, normal, everyday girl. Pink as a color represents this for her character very well, and after the corruption of her life by the hands of Jessie, her wearing pink can be seen as an effort on her part to feel normal again, or like her old self again. When she wears pink, it's very often complemented with white or gray, white being seen as a youthful and innocent color, which she feels like she's lost both. So it seems like her wearing white and gray helps her try to strive for that again. I've always interpreted Sarah as this character who was thoughtful and not that aggressive. And vampirism for the main three vampires as a whole has changed their personalities a lot in this way, with aggression being one of the more notable examples for me. Both Rory and Erica aren't portrayed as violent in the few moments we see them before they're turned in the movie, and while Sarah's a fledgling, she only resorts to violence when she has to, never picking a fight or being the instigator in any plots. That's very much not the case for season two, if you know, you know. So Sarah wearing pink is just a callback to her thoughtfulness and tender nature that came easier to her before she turned into a vampire. To quote colorpsychology.org, the most prestigious place to get research from, while red represents passion, pink stands for tenderness. Keep that in mind when we talk about Erica. We also see Sarah in a lot of purple, which I would argue is her main color association throughout the show. Her iconic winter formal dress is purple with a little bit of green in there, and just from memory, I would say I think it's the color she wears the most throughout the show. Her iconic winter formal dress is purple, and just from memory, I would say that it's the color she wears the most throughout the show. Purple is a very complex color, and we see it have many different meanings and interpretations throughout history. Purple has been associated with royalty and luxury, but also death in many cultures, specifically in Latin America. Imagination and exploration are also associations, showing how she's exploring her new life after death. Her winter formal dress also specifically has green in it, which can signify growth and moving on from a past life, which is what she's forced into after having to save Ethan's life and sacrificing her own. Also, purple can be seen as a mix of the two other colors she wears, both blue and pink. I know technically it's red and blue, but like, you know, just, just go with it, okay? Let me have this. Sarah mainly wears blue when she's sad or in a serious situation, and it's usually paired with black. It's not that often, but often enough to get a quick mention. Ethan's main color is also blue, so we'll talk about that color and the associations with it when we get to him. 
Season two shows Sarah in much different costuming than in the first and in the movie. While she keeps her signature layers of boots and skinny jeans, those are all pretty basic trends of the time, so it's obvious that that would transition into the next season. We see her in a lot more boho styles of clothing with looser fits and busier patterns, all with a very feminine edge there to tie it all together. Overall, you can interpret this boho style as being something that was popular at the beginning of the 2010s as well as the 2000s. But I would say that her styling is much more reminiscent of Vanessa Hutchins at Coachella, so you can definitely tell the difference in years in clothing choices uh, between the seasons. I'll talk more about that when we get to Rory. But overall, this sort of boho style shift can be seen as the writers trying to visually represent that like she's a lot more calm and collected now as a vampire, and that they were going to put that arc of her not being comfortable with being immortal on the back burner, essentially. At the beginning of season two, she literally tells Ethan, like, I don't want to worry about the season one drama. I'm just here to have fun. But what happened? Did you find Jesse and make him pay for turning you into a vampire? And I'm fine. Okay. I have some new challenges, but I've accepted it, so let's just move on, okay? So it can be interpreted that they were maybe going to comment and analyze more of her conflictions with being a vampire in season three, but the show got canceled after season two, so that is all her style evolution gets to be. I would argue that the vampires are the most well-dressed characters throughout the show, so we're going to talk about them first, and now we're going to get into Erica. Erica also dresses very feminine, but her style is a lot more seductive and risque than Sarah's, who is more soft and reserved. Erica favors bold colors and high contrast outfits, which fits her personality and transformation over time. I would say her color palette is the most obvious out of all of the cast, with her main colors being red, black, and white. She also has a smattering of light blue in there, but it's very small. Erica's color palette reflects her personality since she's vivacious, aggressive, and lustful. And when I use the word lusting, I mainly mean the second definition, not entirely in a sexual way. I mean lusting as in an overwhelming desire or craving. She seems to be constantly wanting or desiring something, whether it's blood or attention, popularity, and also boys. I'll admit that too. But I just wanted to clarify that. I'll just say it is a bit weird that they're portraying a high schooler like this. I, I fully am aware of that. Erica's actress, Kate Todd, specifically is a few years older and over the age of 18 compared to the rest of the cast, so it makes me think that they hired an older actress for this character specifically so they could sexualize her more, which is weird, guys. Don't do that. Red seems to be her main color even before she turns into a vampire, but it becomes a lot more obvious once she has turned. Her famous thin red glasses and red overcoat highlight the fact that this is a dormant part of her personality that I think would be more prevalent if she had the chance, which she does get when she gets turned into a vampire. Her light blue I Love Boys Who Sparkle t-shirt is pretty iconic, and I would say it was important to have her not in red during her transformation scene so it can come across of this like corruption of character because she's in light colors. She also seems to be in a lot of silver, which I quite enjoy. Her silver Cinderella style transformation dress that we see later on in the movie is an example of this as well as later in season one. Red, as we know, is a very passionate and aggressive color. It is the color of blood <laughs> and is also associated more with lustfulness, which we see when she's constantly chasing after boys in season one. Overall, Erica is the only character to not be in every episode of season one. She's missing from two episodes. And most often than not, she's not involved in the plots at all and only really shows up for a scene or two before disappearing for the rest of the episode. So I think her outfits were constructed to give her a very eye-catching look that gives a shorthand on who she is as a character and her relationship with everybody else in the series. By season two, she has sort of warmed up to the gang as a whole and seems to be more comfortable hanging out with Benny, Ethan, and Rory, which she was not at all in the movie or season one. She very much has this idea that she's a popular girl and she likes to withhold the social order within high school and likes the fact that she now has power because she was powerless back when she was a nerd with glasses and her hair in a ponytail. 
By season two, she seems to be embracing more earth tones, more grays and browns, which I think maybe shows her leaning more into a connection with a more normal sense of self rather than being constantly obsessed with gaining power over others and drinking other people's blood. Not that she doesn't do that anymore, but that does seem to be the case. She also wears a lot more feminine clothing and a lot more animal print, which I think is fine. Some of the outfits are a bit gauche in my opinion, um, but I do like her when she's in a little bit more feminine clothing and lighter colors. She doesn't need to be in red in literally every single outfit, so I can appreciate these dresses and she really does love a statement necklace. Although I will say that they do put her in a lot of business casual, which I know was popular at the time, but it does make her look old. <laughs> Maybe this was an implication of her maturing more and dressing more like a grown up. Again, this is something they maybe could have explored in season three more. Overall, I love Erica. She's my queen. I'm okay with her killing people. It's legal when Erica kills people and I love her. She's mainly a background character who is somewhat one note, but shows evolution throughout her style and cooperation with the other characters. Next, we have Rory, one of my favorite style icons in the show. <laughs> I had to pause there for a second because I was like, am I actually going to call Rory a style icon? And the answer is yes, I definitely am. Now that we're getting into the boys of the show, there's not going to be as much to say about their clothing choices because... I mean, they're already supposed to dress like nerds, and on top of that, men's fashion, especially for teenage boys, is, like, non-existent. So, you know, if I'm seen to be reading into things too much, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in the movie, all of the boys, but especially Rory, are seen in very, very stereotypically nerdy clothing choices. He wears a lot of plaid short sleeve collared shirts buttoned up all the way to the top. That neckline is tight. And we sometimes see him in a blue and black striped zip-up jacket. This is supposed to be September when the movie starts, so it's supposed to be a little bit cold outside. Something you pick up on in the movie is that Rory really wants to be friends with Ethan and Benny, but they don't really like him at all, and they just see him as like a peripheral friend, even though he wants them to be like a trio of sorts. So in a lot of ways, you could see his styling trying to mimic and replicate what his friends are wearing. But after Rory turns into a vampire, he has a very dramatic clothing shift to replicate how he feels about becoming a full vampire. He is in classic rapper swag clothing with chains and oversized zip-ups and graphic t-shirts. Also, he literally styled his hair like Alice from Twilight. That cannot be anything other than a reference point, and I think that's iconic. So we see him in a lot more swaggy clothing throughout the movie, but this is pretty much dropped for season one, where he's back to his more sort of nerdy clothing choices. Although I specifically noticed that Rory is really into color coordination. So instead of having those plaid short sleeve collared shirts buttoned up, they're opened and they have graphic t-shirts underneath them. And the graphic t-shirt and the flannel are always matching each other. Rory is a joke character. His whole goal within the show is to provide runner gags throughout episodes. So because of that, he is a sort of court jester role, even more than Benny in that sense. So because of that, Rory's main colors are the primary colors of red, yellow, and blue. Red is a color that he wears when he's in his most vampiric state of mind. We see that famous red and black zip up at the end of the movie. And blue and yellow are his more average colors that he wears when he's hanging out with the gang or when he's put on a new persona like Rory Vampire or Vampire Ninja. And I would argue that he wears blue the most often when he's hanging out with Benny and Ethan and is maybe trying to be their friends more often than not. The other color he wears the most, which I would say is his actual main color out of the three, is yellow. Yellow is of course the color of sunshine and is associated with happiness and joy. And Rory is a very bubbly character at the end of the day. He doesn't really seem to have any qualms or cares about being a vampire or caring about revenge like Erica. He's just having a good time and is vibing. So he is constantly wearing yellow to represent that. And by season two, they really seem to lean more into a more emo kind of, dare I say, crunk core style of clothing. I know I bring up crunk core too many times in my videos for it to be a coincidence. I'm sorry guys, don't come for me. But in season two, we see this melding of more nerdy styles with the more swag styles. And we see a lot more emo culture elements come out. 
He wears a lot of black skinny jeans as well as colorful skinny jeans in general and a lot of women's graphic t-shirts. This kind of, to me, signals the sort of emo style that was happening around the time. It had started to fade by the late 2000s and early 2010s, but it was definitely still a subculture that existed, and the sort of androgynous style was very popular at the time, so the boys and girls wore the exact same things, and what Rory is wearing in all of these episodes is exactly what, like, an emo scene queen girl would wear, minus, like, a tiara or something. And I think the scene queen styling is a reference to how he dramatically shift clothing choices in the movie and how that those two styles have molded together. Kind of like how his average ordinary sunshine lifestyle has now molded with his vampire lifestyle. Rory's a style icon. I still wear red Converse to this day, probably because I saw him wearing them back in 2012 when my brain was still moldable. I most definitely owned a pair of colorful skinny jeans and also that Galaxy Cat t-shirt. There's no way I did not own that as a kid. I wish I had a photo to prove it. Now let's talk about Benny Weir, who I don't have much to say on in his actual style, but I do have a lot to say about Stripes. So if you weren't aware of this already, Benny as a character exclusively wears clothing items with stripes on them. There is very rarely, if ever, a situation where he isn't wearing something that has stripes on them, specifically horizontal stripes. Why is this the case, you ask? It's literally in every single episode, so it has to be intentional, right? Well, I'm glad you asked. The history of stripes can be traced back to the beginning of textiles, with wool yarn that had a slight color variation being used in the same textile, creating a warped stripe effect, which would be done intentionally if that was the goal. The invention of dyed yarns is, of course, what the true origin of striped clothing was, although it was not the most popular throughout society, even up to antiquity. In the European Middle Ages, stripes began an association with deviance and abasement. Just to clarify real quick, I'm getting all of this information from an article published on lovetoknow.com written by John S. Major. Their main source of information from this article is a book written by Michael Pastoreau, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce French names, called The Devil's Cloth, A History of Stripes and Striped Fabric. I tried to find a copy of this book under $30 and I couldn't, so I'm sorry I didn't get to actually read the main source from this article. I wanted to for this video, but like I said, I had a hard time finding a copy. So all the information is going to be coming from that article written by Major. So to quote John S. Major, a loose, lightweight, pajama-like union suit with a brightly striped cloth with a broad collar and cuffs is the iconic outfit of the clown, a figure whose humor derives from his license to transgress the boundaries of orderly society. So yes, Benny is a literal clown. Specifically, the costume designers have gone for the most nerdy and lame clothing choices they could possibly go for for the boys early on in the series, with those ugly army brown shoes and ill-fitting denim slash sweatpants. I really hate all of the brown Benny wears in season one. It was a running joke on our podcast that we hated all of his brown outfits. So even though their horrible style is intentional, that doesn't mean it's fun. So I think all of the stripes and plaid was mainly to give the association of Benny as a big loser, since a lot of his behavior, especially towards women, is embarrassing and should not be seen as aspirational. He is also the main comic relief character, since he is constantly cracking jokes and trying to get attention for himself. So that's where his clownish behavior is the most obvious. I called Rory a court jester and Benny is much of the same. However, Benny is more of a clown in the same way that they are in Shakespeare plays, where they're irreverent and constantly commenting on the other characters and making fun of them, yet everyone doesn't just kick him out and they still give him money for whatever reason. Season 2 fares a lot better with the two mortal characters maturing and growing up more. We see less polo shirts and more crew necks and intentional layering, instead of just looking like Grandma Weir forced a long sleeve or jacket on him before he ran out the door. While the polo shirts were very trendy for their time, I'm glad to be mostly rid of them by the end. Benny was supposed to grow more as a magic user and force of knowledge regarding those topics, so while his stripes are too iconic to ever rid the character of, his slightly more tailored and deliberate choices in Season 2 seem to reflect that. Sadly, we never get to see Benny actually stop becoming a douchebag and actually become good at magic, but 
I would like to think that his style would reflect more of his maturing sentiment and growth of knowledge over time, considering he is so, so ignorant and dumb throughout most of the early parts of the series. And I like Benny in this series. I think his dynamic with Ethan is amazing. They're meant to be, they're in love, whatever you want to say. But just because I like him as a character in a TV show does not mean I would want to like the person in real life. And that's very much the case for this character. Last but not least, we have Ethan. Ethan is such a 1980s supernatural movie main character lead, isn't he? We all talk about how much he looks like Winona Ryder, and his ethos as a character is definitely built on this karate kid sentiment that the quiet wallflower could become the one who saves the world. Or at least, attempt to save the world. <laughs> I think there's a 1980s teen main character influence on his style with his denim jackets and plain nerdy style. Although I will admit it is impossible to ignore the intensely 2000s graphic t-shirts he wears throughout the series, which I would argue is his lasting legacy that he has in fashion in the modern day. These vaguely trendy t-shirts speak to his desire to be a boring, normal high school kid who blends into the background and doesn't call much attention to himself. I know it's hard to believe, but these extremely busy shirts would have made him look more normal than anything else at this point in time. Ethan's main colors we see seem to be blue and black, with a little bit of maroon and gray sometimes in there as well. While blue can be seen as a color of sadness, it is also a color that represents leadership and intelligence, which is what Ethan represents in his friend group. He's the main problem solver of the gang, and his second sight gives him wisdom that the other characters don't have. He's the analytical, while the others are the action doers. People may call me a crackpot for this, and I'm completely fine with that. I'm in too deep when it comes to the Mabav overthinking lore. I think Ethan and Sarah have a lot of commonality when it comes to what they want to be and who they see themselves being as they quote unquote grow up. And so, because Ethan's main color is blue, and Sarah sometimes wears blue, I see it as a color that they connect with each other, and a color that represents their kind of emotions, you know, both sadness and their smarts, as well as their role of leadership among the group. They can relate to the feeling of being normal teenagers who are caught up in the mess of supernatural fighting and lore both with these supernatural powers that they didn't ask for and didn't think they were going to have in the first place, which greatly affect their ability to live normally. So I think the quiet moments they have with each other throughout the show represent their relationship well with this color. Blue is also seen as a calm and soothing color, similar to the color of the ocean and sereneness. Even though Sarah doesn't seem to have feelings like that for Ethan, she does agree to go on a date with him, in my opinion, because it'll make her feel more like a normal teenage girl who casually dates and has a relationship that isn't all tied up in this supernatural trauma and mess like she did with Jesse. And Ethan is what represents that state of normalcy for her, what she could be and what she could achieve with her powers and with her life, because Ethan seems to have it all put together, but that is until the Lucifractor comes into detail. Over time, Ethan moves from little to no patterns at all in his clothing, and in the same way as Benny, has more intentional layering and attention to items of clothing placed together. Whether or not this was the costume designers realizing this in real time is beyond the point in my opinion. Ethan's denim jackets specifically are my favorite element of his style, since it's the perfect balance of nostalgic and timelessness, which a lot of other things he wears lacks in my opinion. Ethan is the audience insert character in the series, yet he still has his own distinct personality and style that all tie in with the other characters and the overall message of the entire show. If you want to know more about those other elements of the series, feel free to watch my extremely long deep dive video into the entire series, including character breakdowns and more. Shout out to Patrick Antosh for his costume design work, since I bet the stunts and budget restrictions really limited what they were able to do, and this fun and complex creation was able to come out of it all nonetheless. I just realized that my microphone has not been recording this whole time. Awesome. I need to wash this off my face, so we're just gonna pretend that the intro and outro don't sound like ass, okay? Please guys, <laughs> please bear with me here. So thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Please let me know your opinions down in the comments below. If you think I'm reading way too much into this, fair enough. <laughs> or if you agree with me and you think that this show deserves a lot more 
interesting and in-depth analysis, uh, then feel free to subscribe because that's literally all we do here. I have a podcast. I know everybody has a podcast, guys. I'm sorry. But I have a podcast with my friends where we reviewed every episode of Mabav in depth. So if you want a sort of like podcast to listen to while you watch the show, kind of like a, a rewatch podcast of sorts, uh, that'll be linked in the description as well. Go buy the merch. Go check out the website. It has a bunch of cool stuff on there. Get some discounts. Get some limited edition merchandise. As I'm recording this, I have not reached 1,000 subscribers yet, but we're, we're trying to reach that goal, okay? We're working towards it, so I would appreciate every subscriber. It, it really does mean a lot to me. And tune in next week, hopefully, where we'll be talking about My Babysitter's Vampire once again. I'm thinking of maybe spoiling the topic because I love you guys for sitting all the way through this video. For a little bit of a hint at what you might be seeing later on in this month, I will be doing a history deep dive into how Mabav was created because a lot of people don't know the history behind how it was conceived and who made it. So look forward to that. And also I will be doing a deep dive with my podcast buddies into the queer and fandom elements of the show that have sprouted out in the modern day. So make sure to tune in if you're interested in those topics. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you like the channel. I've said that a million times now. I'm desperate apparently. Just kidding. Do whatever you want. Uh, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Happy Monstober. I mean Monsterfest, everybody.